Seven months. That's the time difference between the release of Brothers in Arms Road to Hill 30 and Earned in Blood. Seven months. Now, if you watched my Road to Hill 30 video, you may understand why this worried me. If you haven't, that video is in the description or in the right hand corner of the screen now. Whilst I enjoyed replaying Road to Hill 30, I definitely had my fair share of issues with the game that I'd hoped had been resolved in Earned in Blood. And then I learnt it took 7 months to develop and release, and those hopes were, let's just say, definitely lessened. With all that being said though, I do remember Earned in Blood much more than I did Road to Hill 30, and from memory, I honestly had a great time with this game back in the day. Granted, I was 8 back then, and was honestly just happy to be playing anything. But at release, Earned in Blood reviewed really well, so there has to be something here, right? Well, that's why we're revisiting the game today. How does Brothers in Arms Earned in Blood hold up today? Is it a game worth your time revisiting? Did Gearbox improve upon Road to Hill 30's flaws here with Earned in Blood in just 7 months? Or does Owned in Blood disappear into the masses of World War II first person shooters? Let's find out. Brothers in Arms Owned in Blood's story is once again set during the Normandy invasions, D Day, and the battles that followed closely afterwards. Except this time around, the game begins with our new protagonist. Sergeant Joe Red Hartsock, I'll be referring to him as Red for the rest of the video, beginning an interview with Colonel Marshall, who is interviewing the paratroopers 15 days after D-Day. The story for Earned in Blood told as Red is reflecting on essentially the same timeline of events we've already experienced with Baker in Road to Hill 30, just from Red's perspective. The story begins at the initial D-Day drop, and again, this drop didn't go as planned, and sees Red entangled in a tree, unarmed, and about to face death at the hands of a German soldier, before he is saved by Seamus Doyle of the 82nd. From here, the story splits into three parts. The first part is Red's point of view from his time in Baker's squad, which takes us to just after the battle for Hill 30, as Red's actions in the battle lead him to be promoted to second squad's leader. The second part is Red and second squad's liberation and defense of Carrington and the assault on Bopt. And the third and final part is centered around helping the 82nd and Doyle in capturing and clearing Saint Savoir. Now, I know this is a very basic and short story breakdown, but once again, the bulk of Earned in Blood's story is centered around the historical battles and those events, which I'll take a deeper look into during the next segment. And the story by Gearbox is more so centered around the brotherly aspect. First and foremost, though, I enjoyed Earned in Blood's story much more than Road to Hill 30's for a couple of reasons, but one is the Brothers in Arms aspect. A big problem I had with Road to Hill 30's actual story was the fact that I didn't really know who anyone on the squad was and felt Baker had no real connection to them, leading characters to die and a shoulder shrug from this guy. Whilst Earned in Blood still, in my opinion, doesn't nail this aspect, it definitely improves. Maybe it's because the story retraces a lot of its steps from Road to Hill 30, but I actually knew who most of these characters were this time around, and you can tell Red does care for his brothers in arms, as he will pause his interview or need a moment to compose himself in certain situations to allow him to process 
a traumatic event or the last time he'd see his squad mates alive together. This was a really intelligent approach to the storytelling because it gives the player a feeling that despite the same events, this story is different. And great job by Red's voice actor, David McGarry, who sucked me into the character. I do wish I cared more about squad mates dying, but even Doyle who was around a lot, I just didn't feel anything when he died, which again, for a game titled Brothers in Arms, it's a problem. At least I know who is dying this time though, which is an improvement. But it's an aspect of potential that this series has that, at least so far, it just doesn't work. The story on the whole though, when you include the history, is a good time. The story still has a few too many faults for my personal liking, but surprisingly in just 7 months, whilst they went back to the same historical event we've played and reused a lot of characters and battles, Red's version of this story did a much better job at connecting me to at least someone in this story. But the history once again does carry the story for the most part. I know what you're thinking, didn't you go over this already in Road to Hill 30? Yeah, I did, but more so about the 101st Airborne Division and the 502nd Parachute Infantry Regiment, and also biffed the whole segment when I doubted if the 502nd were at the Battle of Bloody Gulch, which is codenamed Hill 30. I'm a dunce, what can I say? So I'm here for redemption, and this time I'd like to talk more about the battles we experience in-game, the 82nd Airborne Division, and even the interviewer behind the story, S.L.A. Marshall, in-game as Colonel Marshall. Let's begin with Marshall though. Samuel Lyman Atwood Marshall, also known as Slam, which is badass and what I'll be calling him from now on, was a military journalist and historian. Slam joined the US Army during World War I and served in the 315th Engineer Regiment, which took part in some major battles for the war, such as the Battle of St. Mihil and the Mios Argonne Offensive. Post World War I, Slam became a newspaper reporter and editor and by World War II, he was an official army combat historian. Slam conducted hundreds of interviews with soldiers about their combat experience, but he loved group interviews with surviving members of a frontline unit. This was a highly intelligent move on Gearbox's behalf to include a character like Marshall in the storytelling for Earned in Blood. And from my research, from appearance to his work, I think they nailed this aspect of history in a unique way. The 82nd, much like the 101st, is another famed airborne division, but the 82nd saw battle during World War I, again with highlights or highly recognised missions being Saint Mihil and Mios Argonne. But during World War II and before Normandy, the 82nd had already seen two combat drops taking part in the campaign to invade Sicily and the Battle of Anzio in Italy. In regards to Operation Overlord or the Battle of Normandy though, the 82nd was tasked with Mission Boston, an assignment deemed riskier than Mission Albany and tasked to the 82nd because of their previous combat experience. Like the 101st though, several regiments within the 82nd missed their drop zones, but still managed to complete their missions of securing Utah beach exits, creating roadblocks, disrupting German communications, and eventually link up with the 101st. Now, whilst we don't see many of the actions the 82nd took part in here with Earned in Blood, as Doyle is a part of the 82nd and Red the 101st, it's still a brief insight into the division that inspired me to dive deeper into the topic and learn more about this 
honestly incredible division. As for the battles, obviously the Battle for Bloody Gulch is a central one, along with the Battle of Carrington and the Battle of saint savoir le vicomte As I said with Road to Hill 30, after I made a fool out of myself, the Battle of Bloody Gulch is depicted really well in game. It really was a battle which seemed impossible to succeed. Pinned down by Germans at all flanks, tank fire, and no backup coming anytime soon. In Earned in Blood though, we are tasked with clearing the left flank, which did collapse in reality and was only held down by a couple of soldiers destroying a German tank. The Battle of Carrington was an operation that lasted multiple days as the German forces tried to split the US forces. The 101st were given the task of capturing and defending Carrington as it was a town that German reinforcements would need to pass through to flank US forces. So a pretty important battle to win in order for Operation Overlord to succeed. And the Battle of saint savoir le vicomte in which the US forces were trying to reach the western coast and needing to proceed through and capture the fortress of saint savoir the Germans were dug in deep though, and their defences held strong from the US's infantry until the tank and glider infantry arrived and broke through German front lines, and eventually most of the German forces retreated or offered little resistance. All of this history is why despite the game's flaws, I am always interested in what's going on. I love when there is a little nugget of truth behind my gaming, but Brothers in Arms and for this video's sake, Earned in Blood, just take that extra care and attention to detail in regards to these historical battles, divisions and people to the next level. And it's that aspect of this series and its pursuit of realism that I'm all about. I think it's amazing. The gameplay for Earned in Blood is really where that 7 month production time feels most prevalent. I feel like I'm about to go over my thoughts on Road to Hill 30 just as a part 2. It has its improvements but they do feel somewhat minor, and yet somehow, I enjoyed myself much more this time around. I know, it surprised me too because the gun sway is still here, leading the player to feel like they're about to be hypnotised, gun's accuracy is still suspect, the friendly AI is still inconsistent in some situations being just outright brain dead, but they improve the enemy AI, which only points out the friendly AI even more. And the pacing is still a little off, with little time to breathe and just non-stop fighting. And then a new issue of having tank units feel a little worthless, as there always seems to be something that will insta-kill them. Which means leaving them where they are for a long period of time, clearing an area, and waiting for them to catch up. But this time around, I had an easier time brushing these issues aside, and I think that's because I'd had more time to come to grips with the mechanics. For instance, yes, the shooting is difficult to get the hang of, but it does incentivize using your squad more often than not, and if you have squad mates still alive, you can grab extra ammo off them. Not sure if you could do that in Road to Hill 30, but maybe you could, I don't know. And this led me to shoot far more rapidly, feeling like I was killing enemies much quicker. It's just too difficult to get those precise shots, so if you suppress the enemy, flank them and just unload, I found I had a lot more fun by doing this. Should I have to find workarounds to make the game more enjoyable? No, I shouldn't, but I still had fun playing the game like this, and with the more open nature to the level design, it does feel more encouraged to get closer to your enemies with flanking opportunities feeling much more frequent. Whilst I do have an issue still with the pacing and no real rest between engagements, 
I will say there are some great battles to be had. And again, not a good thing that the enemy AI is sort of good and the friendly AI isn't. But it makes each battle or ambush feel really intense. Again, I can see the issues here in the gameplay. And it really does feel like more of the same in this aspect of Urns in Blood more than anything else. But I can't really explain it. I found workarounds or more positive perspectives this time around. And I think that's because my expectations for replaying Road to Hill 30 and Earned in Blood were very far off. I had a more realistic expectation when replaying Earned in Blood. And I think that's why I enjoyed it more so than Hill 30. Brothers in Arms Earned in Blood was a really strange game in regards to giving it a full retrospective. As you can tell, it's my shortest one for a while now, and that really does come down to just how many similarities there are between Road to Hill 30 and this game. A lot of my issues do carry over sadly, which was more than likely going to happen when considering the development time. And yet, I enjoyed myself a lot more. I really enjoyed the approach to storytelling, I still love the history behind this game and series, and the gameplay still has the same flaws with minor improvements and new issues as well, but I still had a great time playing the game. So far the Brothers in Arms series is a confusing one for me to revisit because I see its faults and yet somehow still have a good time. What I will say about Earned in Blood though, is I personally think it is the better game out of the first two, despite feeling more like a standalone expansion rather than a full sequel. Really though, I think Road to Hill 30 and Earned in Blood come as one game. You should play them as if they are one experience, and again, despite its flaws, I think you can have a good time with both games. Next up though is the one I am really excited to revisit. Brothers in Arms Hell's Highway. Does it finally justify that nostalgia I felt for the series beforehand? I guess we'll wait and see. For now though, this has been my Brothers in Arms Earned in Blood Retrospective.